Today, we're going to take a look at the graphics pipeline and go over different types of rendering. Let's go. So we're just getting into this new series of videos on performance optimization. Before we begin, I want to ask everyone a favor. I've been doing optimization for a long time and I know a lot, but I don't know everything. During the video, if there's something you notice that I leave out or don't get quite right, please let me know in the comments. It's important to me to make these videos as helpful as possible, and your contributions of additional information can really help with that. Thank you. We'll get into a bunch of specific topics related to making your game run faster later in the series, but before we do that, it's important to understand the fundamentals. We're going to cover two major fundamental topics today. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the graphics pipeline so you'll understand what the hardware is doing to render your game. And second, I'm going to go over the major types of rendering, forward rendering and deferred rendering. As I mentioned, it's important to understand these fundamental principles before we get into what to optimize specifically. All right, so let's get going. When an object is rendered, the data starts out on the CPU, where your 3D program, Unity, Unreal, Maya, or a game, passes vertex data through the graphics API, the uh, DirectX, Metal, or Vulkan, to the graphics driver. In future videos, we're going to talk a lot about draw calls. A draw call is a command that your 3D software or game issues to tell the computer to render an object or part of an object. The CPU needs to process the data in the draw call here in this stage. And this is really where optimization starts. So when we get into it, a major focus of the series is going to be on reducing the rendering load by lowering the number of draw calls. Anything we can do to reduce the number of draw calls that the CPU has to process and then send to the GPU will improve performance. So we're going to go deeper into options for doing that in a future video. All right, so the driver sends the data to the GPU's front end which is the part of the graphics chip designed for communicating with the CPU. This data path between the CPU and the GPU has limited bandwidth, and so we're also going to discuss something that can be done to, uh, to reduce how much information has to be sent between the two processors. Then, the data gets sent to the programmable vertex processor. This is the part of the graphics chip where your vertex shader runs. The vertex data consists of vertex positions in object space, UV coordinates, vertex colors, and normals. The most important thing that the vertex processor does is transform the vertex positions from object space where they start to screen projection space so that they can be turned into triangles and drawn to the screen. But the vertex shader that you create can also animate the positions of the vertices, scroll the UV coordinates, bend the vertex normals, and even calculate lighting or other data and store it in vertex colors. When programmable graphics hardware was brand new, most of the work on the GPU was done here at the vertex stage but now, the vertex shader mostly just does the vertex transforms and most of the magic happens in the pixel shader. However, if there are operations in your shader that can be moved from the pixel shader back here to the vertex shader instead, like scrolling the UV coordinates or calculating fog, you can speed up performance a lot by doing these calculations per vertex instead of per pixel. If the polygon count in your scene is too high, this is where the bottleneck is. But really, it's the number of vertices that's causing the slowdown. 
It's taking the GPU too long to transform the vertices from object space to screen projection space. We'll get into uh, what to do about this problem a bit later in the series. The next thing that happens is called primitive assembly. The graphics chip connects all of the vertices together to create triangles. So the result of the vertex shader combined with the primitive assembly step is triangles on in screen projection space. Then the data gets passed to the rasterization and interpolation unit. The job of this hardware is to convert the triangles into pixels on the screen. So instead of just having a set of triangles, we have pixels on the screen that represent the triangles. This process is a little bit like opening an Adobe Illustrator file in Photoshop. The points and curves and lines in Illustrator are converted into pixels in the Photoshop file. That's what's happening here. The hardware is converting our triangles into pixels. The other thing that happens during this step is called interpolation. The data that was stored in each of the vertices is interpolated to the pixels. So for example, with vertex color, we have a blue vertex on the left and a green vertex on the right, and all of the pixels in between get a linear gradient blend from blue to green, and you can see that the same thing is happening with the red vertex on the top here. This also applies to UV coordinates and normals. The data gets smoothly interpolated from the vertices into the pixels. Next, that interpolated pixel data is sent to the programmable pixel processor. And this is where your pixel shader runs. It takes the incoming data from your vertex shader and additional input data from the CPU to create the final results. This is one of the main places on the GPU where slowdowns can happen. If shaders are too complex, it takes a long time for the pixel processor to run them, and this will slow down your game. So we're gonna put a major focus on optimizing shaders in this series and go over a bunch of different things you can do to make your shaders run faster. Now traditionally, the output of the pixel processor has been the final colored pixels on the screen, and then this goes to get some final raster processing before being output to the screen. However, modern game engines use deferred lighting, which means that the pixel processor is outputting color, normal, uh, metal mask, and roughness data instead of final lit uh, results. This data is written to a G buffer, and then the final lighting calculations happen with the data from those buffers in a separate pass. And this is the next process, uh, this is the next topic I wanna cover in the video. Uh, but before we do, the main thing to take away from this understanding of the graphics pipeline is where in the pipeline your shaders are running and where the bottlenecks are. Slowdowns can happen on the CPU if there are too many draw calls, and on the GPU in a couple of places, in the vertex shader if there are too many vertices, and in the pixel shader if the shaders are too complex. So I'm gonna be showing you specific things that you can do for each of these situations later in the series. But remember, like I said before in the last video, it's very important to first figure out where your bottleneck is before you start trying to fix things. You wanna target your optimizations specifically at the part of the pipeline that's causing the slowdowns. If you hear me repeat this point several times, it's because it's important and I want everyone to remember it. Analyze first, then optimize. Okay, let's get back and go into some more depth on the types of rendering I mentioned a minute ago. There are two major methods of rendering, forward rendering and deferred rendering. Forward rendering renders each object to the screen one at a time. 
The shaders applied to the objects contain instructions for both setting material properties and also to uh, calculate the lighting for each object. So the material setup and lighting are all done in one pass for each object. This approach has some positives and some negatives. Because each object's shader does the lighting, this method has the potential to use a different lighting model for every object. So there's a huge amount of flexibility for using a variety of lighting models. This method also requires less VRAM or texture memory, and I'll explain more about this in a minute. With forward rendering, you can control the order that objects are drawn in, so you can render objects from furthest away to closest to the camera, sometimes called uh, back to front rendering. This is a requirement for objects that are transparent. And finally, for simple scenes, forward rendering is a simple rendering method, so it's also fast. On the other hand, for scenes that are complex, especially if they have a high number of light sources lighting each object, forward rendering can get quite expensive. And that's why deferred rendering was developed. With deferred rendering, the rendering process is divided into two steps or phases. In the first step, all of the objects in the scene render their material properties, color, normal, roughness, metallic, into an off-screen buffer called the G-buffer. So after that first pass, we have three or four screen-sized textures that contain the color, normal, roughness, and metallic data, and sometimes a bunch of other kinds of data as well, for the whole scene. In the second pass, the data in those full screen textures is used to calculate the final lighting. This means that the complexity of the lighting calculations is separated from the complexity of the geometry in the scene. And now, this method also comes with its own pluses and minuses. On the positive side, complex scenes with a high number of lights can be rendered a lot faster. And the lighting can use more complex and realistic techniques or formulas because it's just happening using those G-buffer textures instead of using the scene geometry. On the other hand, deferred rendering uses a large amount of texture memory because it has to store that G-buffer data. Also, because all of the lighting is done together in the second step, it makes it harder to use different types of lighting for different objects. It is possible, it just requires more effort and resources. Deferred rendering is fastest when everything in the scene uses the same lighting model. And finally, you can't render transparent objects using deferred rendering because objects are rendered front to back instead of back to front. So, with these positives and negatives in mind for both methods, let's talk about how the methods are used. First, forward rendering is most commonly used for lower-end hardware like mobile devices. And it's also great to use for scenes with just a few light sources. Deferred rendering is great for complex scenes rendered on higher-end hardware like PCs or consoles. Most modern game engines use both methods. In Unreal, for example, deferred rendering is used for the opaque objects in the scene, and then the transparent objects are rendered afterward in a separate stage that uses forward rendering. This allows the transparent objects to be sorted from back to front. And here, I'm going to go off on a tangent for a minute. In Unreal, there's a rendering debug mode that allows you to visualize the cost of the shaders. Cheap shaders are green and red shaders are expensive. The colors are based on the number of instructions that the shader is using. This is nice, but it's also misleading. Have you ever noticed that objects that are transparent are always red? Why is that? 
does that mean transparent objects are super expensive and we should never use them? No. The problem here is that we're comparing apples and oranges. The number of instructions in an opaque object is low because opaque objects are using deferred rendering. So we're only actually seeing the number of instructions used in the first stage of rendering, the ones required to write to the G buffer. The lighting instructions are not included. On the other hand, the transparent objects are using forward rendering, so their shaders contain instructions for both the materials and the lighting. So it's really an unfair comparison. Sure, transparent objects are a bit more expensive to render than opaque ones, but this shader complexity debug view exaggerates the difference and makes the transparent objects look like they're more than twice as expensive, which isn't true. So keep that in mind when you're using this debug view. Okay, uh, back on topic. Because transparent objects are rendered using forward rendering, it's important to reduce the number of lights that are hitting them because using lots of lights in forward rendering is more expensive. And just in general, multiple large light sources can be expensive for both types of rendering, so be careful with lights and don't make them bigger than they need to be. We'll get into more details of all of this in, in a future video in this series. Alright, I think that about does it for this video. Next week, we're going to go over what needs to happen at the beginning of your project in terms of optimization. We'll talk about choosing your targets, discovering the capability of your target hardware, and then setting budgets for the various parts of your scene. And as I said at the beginning, if there's anything I said here that you'd like to expand on or that you think people could benefit from a deeper understanding, put those things down in the comments. I'd like this series to be as helpful as it can be, so if everyone contributes, we can make this a great learning resource. Thanks again for your help, and have a great week.